Minister, and welcome you all to this meeting of the Public Petitions Committee. And can I remind people um, to switch their mobiles or other devices to silent. Agenda item one, we're dealing with a continued petition. Petition 1453 on the Register of Interest for Members of Scotland's Judiciary. Um, so we're taking evidence on petition 1458, which calls for a Register of Interest for Members of Scotland's Judiciary. Um, we're taking evidence this morning from the Lord President, Lord Carloway, who is accompanied by Roddy Finn, Legal Secretary to the Lord President. And I thank you both very much for joining us this morning. We have copies of a number of recent submissions, including the most recent correspondence from Lord Carloway. So in order to make the most efficient use of our time this morning, can I suggest that we move straight to questions from members? And perhaps I can and welcome you, Lord Carloway, um, open up. I want to explore some of the issues that you have identified as potential risks or inhibitions to the administration of justice should a register of financial interests be introduced. And one of these is the risk of retaliation by a dissatisfied litigant by way of online fraud. And you have commented that this has not, to the best of your knowledge, happened in respect of those judges currently required to disclose interest, but the sample size of those judges is too small to derive comfort from. In identifying the, this potential risk, have you given consideration to the experience of other holders of public office who do have to declare their financial interests, for example, MSPs, local authority councillors and members of public bodies, um, all have a role in making decisions um, that may leave people dissatisfied. And are you aware of any individuals in these categories who have been victim to retaliation by way of online fraud? I, I'm not aware of uh, the details of members of the of other public institutions uh, being subjected to online fraud. But I do think that judges are in a peculiar position uh, in relation to this matter. Th th they make decisions which inevitably cause disappointment uh, to one party to a litigation, uh, and they are, and c or can be, resentful. Um, I appreciate that that can happen in wider public life, but it's a particular problem with the judiciary. The losing party can, in some extreme cases, blame the judge for the failure of their case, uh, and seek to find a reason beyond the actual decision as to why that uh, decision why the judge found against them. And it is not unknown uh, for persons to form a, a malicious or hostile intent towards a judge, or even judges in general, if they are disappointed with the outcome of their case. They can become paranoid or suspicious uh, about the reasons for what is a simple finding of fact and law by the judge. Uh, and I would be concerned that if they were to be the source uh, 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 and potentially damage the judge's uh, personal or pecuniary interests. Do you think there's the kind of a, a general culture then, in the sense that mm. um, people look for explanations beyond simply the decision? So they would begin to, and do they do this already, not necessarily around financial matters, of interrogate any connections that judges might have that might explain or try to explain a decision? It's a relatively common phenomenon especially with party litigants, uh, that if they lose the case um, or they lose a particular aspect of it, they search for reasons as to why they have lost the case. And they, they, they will search for reasons uh, which are out with the obvious. In other words, they lost the case because they were wrong in law or wrong in fact. And they will seek to find reasons as to why the judge found against them. And, of course, they will search to find things peripheral to the, the case itself. And that is, uh, that is um, a, a problem that we do have to, to um, put up with, is perhaps the wrong expression, but we do have to deal with. Do you think it's compounded by the world of um, online communication? Does that make it? You talk about online fraud. Do you think that is something that's a particular issue now? Well, as, uh, as followers of, the, of blogs, etc., uh, in relation to judges, um, will know there is quite a lot on the internet which is, shall I say, not terribly complimentary about particular judges. And again, this is something we, we, we have to put up with on a day-to-day -day basis. We are subject to basic abuse by um, litigants of one sort or another on the internet, uh, and um, it's something which should be guarded against. I think, I think in the First Minister's letter, um, to your predecessor in the committee, I think she, she made specific reference to the particular need um, uh, to consider judges' privacy and freedom from 
uh, harassment by not only aggressive media, but specific reference to hostile individuals, including dissatisfied litigants. And that's exactly the, the, the type of thing that I'm talking about. Okay, thanks very much for that, Angus. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. Good morning, Lord Carloway. Good morning, uh, Mr. Flynn. Um, I, I very much appreciate your attendance uh, here today. Um, you've identified a, a possible risk to the inhibition of justice in terms of judicial recruitment uh, or of judges starting to decline positions on bodies such as the Judicial Appointments Board uh, or the uh, Courts and Tribunals Service in the event that judges were required to disclose financial interests. Given the principles guiding conduct in public life, um, why should a requirement for transparency act as a disincentive for judicial office holders, uh, but not for other people holding public office, such as ourselves? A, a judge or sheriff is, uh, is indeed, uh, uh, like many people, a holder of a public office. And the, the critical distinction um, between a, a judge and, uh, and, for example, MSPs, is that uh, is of course, and this is what we're looking at, uh, is that the judge has to be independent of any form of government. So one's in exact opposite uh, position from the, the political dimension. We, the system we have, and I hasten to add that um, the, the, the system here is one which has an international uh, reputation for fairness uh, and has an international. Uh, reputation for not being corrupt, which is something we are uh, extremely keen to protect. Uh, and you'll, you may have seen in the papers that uh, the, the, the Council of Europe has an organisation, their anti-corruption organisation, Greco, uh, which examines and specifically examined potential for corruption in the United Kingdom judiciary, including the Scottish judiciary, uh, in recent years. Uh, and they were fairly clear on their findings, which I think I quote in, in the papers, uh, that there is, um, they, they did not find any element of corruption in relation to judges in, in, in the United Kingdom, nor is there any evidence of judicial decisions being influenced in an inappropriate manner. And because of that, they did not see any necessity to introduce a register of interests uh, specific to the judiciary. Now, answering your question a little more directly, uh, we in Scotland do not have a career judiciary in the sense of having uh, judges who begin their judicial life uh, at the point of leaving university, as they do, for example, uh, in, in many countries on the continent. We recruit our judges and sheriffs from people who are generally, not exclusively, but generally from private practice, and they are recruited in their 40s and 50s perhaps sometimes even a little later, so far as the senior judiciary are concerned. Uh, we have a relatively small pool of um, lawyers of excellence who are uh, capable of taking on the job of um, being a member of our senior judiciary. You may be aware that there are certain problems at the moment in relation to the recruitment of the, particularly the senior judiciary because of certain um, steps which are being taken relative to pay and pensions uh, uh, generally. Therefore, we have particular difficulties with recruitment at the moment. If I were to say to uh, senior members of the profession, which they are, before they were recruited into the judiciary, by the way, if you wish to become a judge, you will have to declare all your pecuniary interests uh, and open them to public scrutiny. I have no doubt whatsoever that that would act as a powerful disincentive for the, uh, for, from lawyers of experience and skill becoming members of the judiciary. And I can assure the committee that, uh, that we need them more than they need us, if I might put it that way. OK, thanks. Um, t taking that on board, um, you mentioned uh, career, the career judiciary. Um, now, you'll, you'll be aware that we took evidence from uh, your predecessor, Lord Gill, uh, and it's probably fair to say he did not have a high regard for the system in the United States, um, uh, where they've had a register of, of judicial interests, as, as you'll be aware. So um, what's your view of the fact that the United States has successfully introduced a register of judicial interests? And would you agree it's helped increase public confidence in the, in the judiciary in that part of the world? I'm not in a position to make any comment whatsoever about the United States judiciary. 
uh, because I simply uh, uh, do not know enough about it to make a meaningful comment. Um, you will be aware that there are problems in relation to the United States judiciary, but the, 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 um, the depth of that is something which uh, I'm simply not qualified to comment on. What I can comment on, and I'm sure what the committee is aware of, is that the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom uh, considered this matter because previously, as members of the House of Lords, uh, they required uh, to have a register of interests, and they decided uh, that they should not have a register of interests. Uh, and I would have thought that, that, uh, that if that is the view of the United Kingdom Supreme Court, that is something which we ought to give uh, some consideration to, uh, even if, of course, uh, we are not bound by the, their decisions in that regard. Okay, thank you. Uh, I may come back with some supplementaries later. Thanks, thank you. Brian Whittle. Good morning, uh, Lord Carroll. Good morning, Mr. And Mr. Flynn. In, in relation to any changes to the current system of recusal, whereby it is for a judge to decide whether or not to recuse, you comment on the inefficient disposal of business in the courts. I'd like to explore the balance between the efficient disposal of business and having systems in place that ensure there is trust in judicial decisions. In that respect, could I ask whether there's any way of quantifying the risks to efficient disposal of business, and if so, whether your office has carried out an assessment of this? Uh, in relation to, uh, are you talking about the process of, of, of declining jurisdiction or recusal, as it's put, the, the processes that we yes. use? Yes. Well, um, could, I, could I start with a little, a little preface uh, and um, state that so far as my own concerns are, uh, uh, exist in relation to this topic, my concern is primarily not that judges are... Uh, not recusing themselves in particular situations because I'm quite satisfied that they do when they should do. My concern, <clears throat> uh, and this is also to do with the disruption of business, is with judge, judges or sheriffs who are recusing themselves unnecessarily in circumstances in which they should not do so. Uh, and that is a, uh, that is a much more common uh, phenomenon. Uh, in other words, uh, you, you, one has to bear in mind, again, uh, we have litigants uh, who will effectively try and forum shop. Uh, that is to say, they will uh, encounter a judge or a sheriff who is not to their um, uh, liking, and they will attempt to uh, remove that judge from the proceedings on pretexts such as having some remote connection with the case or the people involved in it. Uh, and that type of thing can cause major problems uh, in the management of business. The way these things done are in the normal case, where perhaps somebody is, is, is represented by a, a, a member of the legal profession, is that if there is a genuine concern that the judge or sheriff does have an interest in the case, that will be raised informally with the clerk of court uh, and in practical terms, the sheriff or judge will uh, simply decide not to be involved in that particular case. Uh, again, that is not something which can be done in every court, and in particular courts w w which only have uh, one sheriff, and especially if it's not raised in advance. What, we ca what, what happens again, um, in the sense of practicalities and reality, is that uh, civil business, which is again what we're talking about here primarily, I think, uh, can be allocated relatively late in the day. Uh, and a, sh a sheriff or a judge uh, may only, um, on the day in question, um, uh, be faced with an application uh, formally in court to decline jurisdiction in that case. Uh, if he does so, then it is likely that that case will simply have to go off um, with all the inconvenience that that involves. Now, I'm not sure if you wanted me to deal with the, the, there was a specific point about whether, you th whether we think judges uh, uh, should not deal with this question but pass it to another judge, which uh, uh, um, would you wish me to deal with that point? Yeah, or if you not? would, please. Um, again, uh, the, the answer to that particular, to particular problem is this. If a judge uh, does not recuse himself in circumstances in which he should have, uh, then the, uh, any litigant who is dissatisfied with that and loses uh, the case can appeal that, and the matter will be reviewed by three judges. So there is a form of open public scrutiny of a decision not to recuse 
a, a judge. If there was a system whereby that judge could not decide that matter himself or herself, and after all it is he or she who knows whether he or she has got a direct uh, connection with the litigation or the persons involved in it, if that person had to pass the matter on to another judge or sheriff, you would, you would cease the business in that case uh, for the particular period of time until that matter was decided. Uh, you would also cease the business which is scheduled for the other sheriff or judge uh, in order that that other judge could take the decision. That other judge is likely to find the decision very difficult if he or she doesn't know the particular facts. So I hope I'm, uh, uh, um, in a realistic sense, explaining the disruption to business that these decisions uh, can involve. And the simplest way to deal with them is the way we are dealing with them at the moment, uh, is that, first of all, there is the informal route, uh, which would mean that the judge or sheriff is not, not hearing the case in the first place, but if that judge decides that he or she should hear the case in any event and is faced with a formal motion to recuse himself, that matter is dealt with in open court, transparently, and is subject to the appeal process. Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener. Just uh, picking up on, on, on this specific issue. Um, we've received a submission to this petition from Melanie Collins in which she highlights a recusal which had, for whatever reason, uh, not been added to the register of recusals, uh, and this was only noticed or challenged one year after the omission. Now, Lord Gill told us in November uh, 2015, when he gave evidence here, that uh, to the best of his knowledge, uh, well, I quote, to the best of my knowledge, the clerks of court are scrupulously accurate in keeping the register, and therefore, wherever there is a recusal, a, a recusal you may depend upon it being recorded in the register, end quote. So does it not concern you that the recusals have in the past failed to have been listed in the register of recusals and um, the fact that the register is being altered in some circumstances years later and only when members of the public, media or litigants point out that there are gaps in the register of recusals? I note that there was an error in not recording one particular instance, incident. Uh, I'm not particularly concerned about that. Uh, the, the position is that all uh, recusals uh, of the type which appear in the register um, are as a result of uh, uh, events which occur in open court, in public forum, uh, and they are recorded in the interlocutor of the court concerned. And, and I think members of the committee have got a copy of the interlocutor, the court order, which deals with the recusal. That is a public document. It's open to public scrutiny, and it's a result of a hearing in open court in which the parties um, would be well aware of the decision and they would have a record of it. So it does not particularly concern me that there was an unfortunate error in transposing that into a register of recusals, which is for a different purpose. OK, and, th and that's the only... Uh, error that you're aware of? The only error that I'm aware of, yeah. but um, the, 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 what, what happens is that the judge or sheriff will make a, um, will make a decision in open court, and the, the, the direction to the clerks of court uh, is that they should transmit that to the judicial office for, so that it can be recorded in the register. Um, if, if that was not done, and it wasn't done in this case, then that is regrettable, but it is, is not a matter of uh, deep concern to me. Um, one mistake in, in, in uh, many instances uh, does not cause me uh, concern about the general system. But you could understand how Melanie Collins would not feel that it was... Uh, well, she was involved in the litigation and therefore she must have known that the decision had been made because she's the diet, she is the person who was presumably uh, in court at the time. She, she or her representatives would have received a copy of the court order dealing with the recusal. Okay. OK, thank you. Thanks. And can I welcome Alec Neal, MSP, uh, who I think has got an interest in this item yeah. as well. Um, I'll call Rona Mackay. What I'll do is complete with the committee members then, if you want to ask a question, you can do so. Thank, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Lord Callaway, um, Mr Flynn. Um, it's just going back to what you said earlier about um, the problems with the, that you perceive with recruitment, should the, a register be introduced. And I wondered, and I may have missed this in the background uh, briefing we have, um, what the Law Society's view on, on, on the whole issue of register of interests is. I don't know the answer to that. You don't know? No. Right. Okay. Fair enough. That's fine. Um, 
Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, Lord Carlo. Good morning, uh, Mr. Flynn. Um, I welcome your indication that you have, made no, no, you have no problem in extending the register of recusals to cover instances where judges have considered recusal. Um, but have made the decision not to recuse. And you indicated that you would consider what you would consider may provide additional transparency, which follows on from Mr. McDonald's comments. Have you considered options for the ways in which it could be made transparent when any additions or amendments are made to the register, notwithstanding what you've already said? Uh, sorry, in relation to? What options to make it more transparent? Um, do you mean in relation to the, we, we could, for example, um, put the parties' names in? Yes. Um, that, that has been considered. It's not thought to be particularly necessary or helpful. Um, again, I, I go back to the fact that all uh, decisions to recuse or not to recuse are done in the public forum. They are done in open court. Um, if anybody wants to see a particular court and has an interest to do so, wishes to see a particular court interlocutor, they can do so. So if someone, for example, uh, was looking at the register of interests and wanted more details of that, then I'm sure we could provide them with that. But we're often anxious not to um, put parties' names uh, in registers of a public nature like this, uh, because there are, as usual, um, cases involving considerable sensitivities, such as children, and so, so on and so forth. So I think we would be reluctant to do that, although it is something that could be done. Yeah, so you feel it could be done, but obviously it would have to be very carefully looked yes. at. Thank you, Kavina. Angus? Yeah, um, thanks, Kavina. Can I just ask, um, Lord President, w would you be content to see information about the date on which an entry uh, is made, uh, or a way of noting amendments to entries in the register, such as to correct clerical errors, as, as we, we, we're aware, uh, happened in, in at least one occasion. Um, do you think that would further enhance transparency? Yes, I think, I think that's a fair point, that, that uh, if an entry is being made um, late, in other words, whatever, we, we could have a protocol that if an entry was being made um, more than um, a fortnight or something like that after... Uh, no, but I mean anything after a fortnight. Um, then, then we could put a footnote entered on such and such a date, yes. OK, that's good. Um, you'll be aware of the, uh, the fact that there was a similar petition in New Zealand uh, two or three years ago, um, which was eventually withdrawn. Um, are you aware of the circumstances... Well, defeated, yeah. Um, are you aware of the circumstances as to what the... Uh, if, are you aware if any um, register was... Uh, introduced in New Zealand uh, along the lines of the register of recusals or uh, a register of interest after after the... I, I'm not, I'm sorry. No, okay. I, I, thought, I thought the matter was ended with the, um, with, with the defeat in Parliament. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, Neil? First of all, convener, can I apologise for being slightly late because I had to go to the audit committee and I apologise in advance if I'm covering ground that's already been, been covered. Can I, can I ask you, first of all, uh, Lord Calloway, an issue of principle... <laughs> Do you think it should be uh, left up to a judge only to decide whether they are going to recuse themselves? Or should that be something that you or the keeper of the role should be able to insist upon if you believe that there's a potential conflict of interest? Um, the, the short answer to, to, to your question is I, is I don't believe that, that, is, that, that there is any problem with the current system. That is that the judge who knows what his connection is with the case or the parties to it should make the initial decision. That decision is made in open court uh, when the parties are present and is subject to review on appeal. In other words, if somebody is dissatisfied with that decision, it will at some point, or if the, if the litigant, certainly if the litigant eventually loses the case, um, it will go before a ju uh, three judges who will uh, review whether that decision was correct or not. And if it was incorrect, then the, the, clearly the decision in the case would, be, would fall. But, but supposing the person bringing the case to court isn't aware of any conflict of interest that the judge may have uh, and uh, it doesn't ever find out, but it may well be that the judge has been influenced by a particular interest, um, surely that's not right. Surely if, if the judge... Um, if, if, if there is any potential conflict of interest, surely there should be some kind of declaration or some commitment by the judge that um, there is no, con you know, an explicit statement there is no conflict of interest. Because uh, if people, are, they might not have the resources to appeal, uh, for example, um, 
So is the, is the system not bal balanced against those people who come to court for justice? No, it, 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 it is not. Um, I, again, I go back to something which I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and this is uh, it's very important. Scotland does not have a corrupt judiciary. This matter has been examined by independent persons, notably the Greco uh, anti-corruption body um, operating under the auspices of the Council of Europe, who examined the United Kingdom judiciary, including the Scottish judiciary, and they were clear that, uh, that fortunately, we, as distinct from many other countries, do not suffer from corruption within the judiciary. Uh, and for that reason, they did not consider that a register of interests was necessary, because if one's introducing this kind of measure, you have to be satisfied, uh, really, that it is necessary and that it is, it is proportionate. So if, it's, if one's analysing its proportionality, one has to look at, well, what exactly are we guarding against here? Now, if uh, the situation where that there were that there was corruption in the Scottish judiciary, which we would discover at, at some point or another, then of course we would have to consider measures to prevent that. One of which may be uh, a register of certain interests. Uh, until such time as it's demonstrated that there is corruption within the Scottish judiciary, I am entirely satisfied that there is no requirement for a register of interests, and that it would be positively detrimental. Um, to the administration of justice, particularly in relation to the recruitment of judges and especially in, at the higher level uh, of the judiciary. Can, can I draw a parallel with the register of interests that members of this parliament have to sign and update on a regular basis? That came about not because of any allegations or belief that the system was corrupt or the MSPs are corrupt. Uh, the 18 years we've been here, I haven't heard one allegation of corruption. But it's not there because of allegations of corruption. It is there to ensure that there is no prejudice. So that if I'm participating in a debate and I have an interest that I have not declared, um, then I'm open to the allegation, not of corruption, but of prejudice. Uh, by having a register of interest and declaring interest, say, in a debate or in a committee like this, then there is a transparency to ensure that I am not acting in a prejudicial fashion. Now, going back to the case cited, as I come in, by Mr MacDonald of Lord Malcolm and the advanced construction in the Donald Nolan case, uh, where Lord Malcolm's son was involved um, as a lawyer with one of the parties. Um, the, the issue there was not an allegation of corruption, it's an allegation of possible prejudice or misconception of prejudice. And that is a very good example of why uh, either a register of interest or a more robust system of recu recusal, or perhaps both, might serve the judiciary very well. Uh, in relation to Lord Malcolm's case, I am satisfied entirely that Lord Malcolm's actions were entirely honourable and he acted in accordance with the Code of Judicial Ethics. Um, I'm not sure what is... What is, what is I, I'm, aware of, I'm aware of the background to it. No, but have you investigated it? Well, I, I've read the papers invo uh, uh, which, invo well, uh, which it involves. Well, with all due respect, you know, Melanie Collins and Donald Nolan have written to you on numerous occasions, and at no time have you replied to them, let alone met them. So you haven't I, heard the other side of the case. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not aware of letters to me by well, the, that particular well, person. Well, your, your office, sorry. Yes, I absolutely. But, 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 you're, you're but my point is, how, how can you reach that conclusion if you haven't heard the other side? I have, I've, I've read um, documents emanating from the persons that you've uh, mentioned. So far as I'm aware, they were not addressed to me, um, but I could be wrong about that. Um, um, but the position is that I'm aware of uh, the circumstances of the case. I'm satisfied that there was, uh, the Lord Malcolm's conduct was entirely correct in the circumstances. But here, this is part of the problem that... Um, that uh, you've perhaps highlighted. This has got nothing to do with a register of pecuniary interests, that case. Uh, the, the, the suggestion is that we should start registering uh, what our relatives are doing and where they're working and matters of that sort, which is going way beyond, uh, I suspect, even what is expected of um, uh, politicians. We do have to register for what close relatives do. Um, can, I, can I deal with the, 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 the difference between MSPs and uh, the judiciary, which I, I think I, I dealt with earlier on uh, in the morning, um, but it's quite a different function. Uh, a politician is by nature 
uh, someone who is not independent in the sense that uh, the public expect the judiciary to be. That's not a criticism, it's a reality. And judges do not deal as a generality with the type of issues which politicians are dealing with. Politicians have executive power. They are dealing with major economic interests of one sort or another. As a generality, judges are not dealing with that type of thing, but are dealing with uh, issues usually between private individuals, but can be between private individuals and government or others. And so they're, they're not dealing with, the, with, with the, the type of issues which politicians are dealing with, such as uh, planning inquiries, etc., uh, at a local level or major e uh, devel economic development in society as a whole. Uh, the, the need for independence in the judiciary is different from the kind of independence which a politician requires. Uh, because with a politician, it's primarily, uh, as, as you pointed out, uh, issues of a pecuniary nature. These, these are not the issues which arise in most of the recusal cases with, with which we are concerned. What we are concerned with as judges is that we appear to be independent of all connection with the case, so that it's not a question of um, having a pecuniary interest. And I think if one looks at the register of recusals, uh, certainly in recent years, or in the last year, I don't think any of them were to do with pecuniary interest at all. It was to do with social connections with people. Whether someone is a friend, whether uh, a party to the litigation is a friend of a friend, and matters of that sort. And these are the type of situations which are raised by people in the practical uh, reality of litigation. And these are the issues which are being dealt with. And unless you're suggesting a, a register of one's friends, and presumably, therefore, one's enemies, uh, then the, the, the real issue with recusal in the judicial system would not be being addressed. Well, again, if I can just finally, yes, draw the, draw the parallel between our register and, and uh, what's being talked about in terms of either recusal or financial interest. Uh, politicians, uh, particularly MSPs, actually, uh, as individuals and collectively, MSPs, unless they're ministers, don't have executive power per se. But it's what's very important is the perception of fairness, the perception that justice has been carried out. And rightly or wrongly, if in any case, without referring to a specific case, if the relative, a close relative of um, a judge is participating in the case, rightly or wrongly, the perception is that there may be a degree of prejudice. Now, it might be very unfair, but the point is to try to ensure that the reputation the excellent reputation of the judiciary down the years in Scotland, that the judiciary retains that reputation, not just for not being corrupt, which we all accept, we're not accusing anybody of corruption, but the perception of fairness, the perception of being um, not prejudiced is extremely important. And I would argue that certainly in at least one case recently, uh, which we have referred to briefly, uh, that perception is that there may have been an unfairness and a prejudice uh, in the way the matter was conducted, particularly as the judge concerned was involved in the case not once but a number of, on a number of occasions. I disagree entirely with your analysis of that particular case, and I repeat what I said earlier. Uh, the, 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 the case that you're referring to uh, um, did not involve the judge's son, as it was, uh, having any active involvement with the case whatsoever. Now, we have uh, very clear rules in our statement of uh, principles of judicial ethics as to how to deal with this matter, and it is made very clear uh, in uh, that uh, statement that uh, if a relative is the advocate in the case before one, then uh, the, the modern approach to that is that the judge should not hear the case, or one could put it another way around, that the relatives should not be presenting the case, whichever uh, way it happens to be put. Uh, so that the older, uh, the situation that we had, say, 20 or 30 years ago, when it was commonplace for the relatives of judges of one sort or another to be advocating the case, that practice no longer exists. Uh, it doesn't exist because it was thought that uh, there was any actual problem with the decision making, but, as you say, because of a perception of unfairness. Now, there is a very clear judicial rule about this, uh, and I am not aware of any case in which that rule has been breached. I myself um, have uh, been in a situation where um, my son has been involved with a particular firm, 
uh, who have been litigating before me. And uh, if uh, that is the case, the judge would be expected to declare that, uh, and uh, the parties would then decide whether to take the point or not. Uh, but if they took the point and the relative was uh, just happened to be a member of the same firm uh, operating in a different department, then I would not encourage the judge to, uh, to um, recuse himself in that situation. Any final questions? No. Can I thank you very much? I think that has been um, really useful in clarifying a lot of the issues that you always had presented to us in written evidence and an opportunity to explore some of these, these issues around you know, prejudice and, and so on. I think that's been really helpful. In terms of how we now um, take this forward, I thought what we might suggest is ask for the petitioners to respond in writing to the evidence and allow us the opportunity to reflect on that. Um, if, if people are, are so minded. And I think that when we are looking at this petition at a future meeting, um, we can obviously consider any further actions members might deem appropriate having read that response. But I do think you know, we might want to make recommendations or suggestions to the relevant decision makers, but that it's clearly not within the powers of this committee to implement the action called for in the petition. But what we will be deciding at that point is how we then take a view on that petition and dispose it to somebody else who would be making that decision. But I think today's evidence has actually clarified, certainly in my mind, clarified a lot of, of the issues. And, and if there's not any, if people are agreed with that? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can I thank you very much indeed for your attendance today. We will be asking the petitioner to respond in writing to what we've heard, but as I said, I think we found that very, very useful to, to clarify from your perspective the issues that have been suggest within the petition. Well, thank you very much, Convener. I'm very grateful for the committee's time in listening to me this morning. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much for that. And can I suspend for a few moments? We can now move to agenda item two on new petitions. The next agenda item is consideration of new petitions. The first new petition we will be taking evidence on this morning is petition 1651 by Marion Brown on behalf of Recovery and Renewal and Prescribed Drug Dependence and Withdrawal. Marion Brown joins us this morning and I want to welcome you to the meeting and can ask you to make an opening statement of up to five minutes after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Uh, first of all, can I just make apologies for Beverly Thorpe, who was hoping to be here today, but her mother's very ill, so thank you. Um, so today, uh, I'm here to represent many people in Scotland who are not well enough to be here in person. Some courageous individuals have provided clear evidence for the committee showing the terrible suffering being endured as a consequence of taking antidepressants and or benzodiazepines as prescribed by their trusted doctors. 
We have previously raised our concerns directly with the doctors, local and national NHS representatives, MSPs and the Cabinet Secretary for Health. We actively contributed to the BMA Board of Science's 2014 UK research and are taking part in the BMA's ongoing work on prescribed drugs associated with dependence and withdrawal. Our, fo our focus now is on raising political, press and public awareness of these issues in Scotland, complementing the activities of the all-party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependence at Westminster. Uh, the SPICE summary that you have links to the current official medical guide guidance and policy. It also outlines the recent BMA recommendations. We've found that major discrepancies exist between what the official medical guidance would have us all believe and the very different actual real experiences of patients. There is a statement in the SPICE briefing which reads, despite licensing procedures and guidance, it is ultimately the decision of clinicians to decide whether or not a drug should be used in the treatment of their patient. And that's a phrase that seems to come back and back in any questions and so on. Clinical trials of medicines are usually carried out over relatively short periods. Patients may be prescribed these medicines over very long periods and perhaps in combination with other medicines. We have found that individual reported patient experience is frequently ignored, put down and dis disbelieved by the clinicians. In benzos, the clear medical guidance is that these should be prescribed for a very short time only and this is not happening. There is substantial evidence for prescribed benzo dependence and withdrawal issues going back decades. In contrast, for antidepressants, medical guidance is that these, sh these should be taken for at least six months and then are com commonly prescribed indefinitely. There are now many people who have been on antidepressants and or benzos for 20 years or a lot longer. Long-term harm is now very clearly apparent. Safe tapering after different periods of prescribed treatment is fraught with difficulties for patients. The very few, mostly online support groups that exist have for years been informally gathering evidence on a trial and error ad hoc patient report and patient self-help basis. This genuine experiential patient learning and sharing has been largely dismissed, disregarded and even denigrated by the medical profession. Now that there is a great deal of patient communication via online social media, as well as extensive internet availability of research and medical information, patients often come to know much more about their own conditions than their doctors possibly can. When patients do try to discuss what they've learned, doctors patronise them and say they shouldn't believe anything they find on Facebook or the internet. These patients find themselves perceived by their doctors as troublesome and difficult heart sink patients and acquire psychiatric diagnoses such as personality disorders and medically unexplained somatic functional or conversion disorders. I'd like to refer to the diagram which is in my own submission, um, which summarises the pattern of the actual patient journey that we've now observed across numerous actual patient accounts of what's happened to them. Patient medical records being confidential to doctors turns out to have unexpected consequences for patients. Self-reported serious drug effect symptoms have been noted in the notes but have not been acknowledged by doctors as drug effects and instead further medicines have been prescribed for the reported symptoms. Complaints procedures tend to be perceived as threatening to doctors. The medical defence organisations encourage doctors to do what any other doctor would do and to comply with current medical guidelines. If patients do complain, this results in professionally defensive responses. So adverse drug effects continue to be unrecognised for what they are and are not reported to the regulator. There is no provision for systemic patient feedback and constructive learning. So to sum up, patients are suffering very serious harm from taking these medicines as prescribed. Dependence and withdrawal problems are causing untold damage. Doctor-patient relationships are being destroyed. All parties are suffering. There are utterly desperate consequences to this. Long overdue recognition of these issues will open the door for honest communication and genuine collaboration, leading to the establishment of appropriate national, regional and local support services for those in need of them and, most importantly, urgent prescribing guideline reviews and updating of doctor education. The principles of duty of candour surely apply here. 
With the focus of Scotland's realising realistic medicine being on listening to patients, shared decision making and collaboration, I hope we can really show by example what this means in real practice. This is raw, genuine, public patient feedback. I'd like to finish with a quote from Black Box Thinking by Matthew Syed, who says, the anatomy of progress is adapting systems in the light of feedback. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. And I think we should record a thanks to all of those who provided submissions. A very significant number of submissions have come in, people talking about their own experience, and that's also going to help the consideration of, of the committee. Um, can I maybe start off with your petition refers to the BMA's recent recommendations on the issue, and one of the BMA's suggestions is for a national 24-hour helpline. So as a starting point, it would be helpful if you could clarify whether you would like the Scottish Government to establish a Scottish helpline or to contribute towards a UK-wide helpline? I think what we envisage is that the, that, that all the, U, that, that the, um, all the you know, be a, a, a total UK thing that the Scottish Government would, would collaborate with all the other UK partners um, so that it would be a... Because if, if you think a helpline could cover the whole of the UK with a telephone system, and a website. The idea would be to have a, a, a connected website with, a, with lots of information. And I think the website would be, especially, would be really, really useful for doctors mm -hmm. and patients, but for doctors and patients. If there was reliable information on there that doctors could um, refer to as well, I think that would be immensely helpful. And that could be, you know, it could cover the whole of the UK, so it would be fairly cost effective in that it could be, you know, it could cover all the regions. And are you aware of? Has the UK government taken action in response to the recommendation by the BMA? I believe the BMA representatives from the BMA met with uh, representatives from the Westminster government uh, on the 22nd of June, but I haven't heard any re okay. report of what happened there. Okay. But certainly they've been approaching the, the, the Westminster government, yes. Okay, that's something we can obviously in inquire about. Um, Rona Mackay? Um, yes, if I could just maybe expand a wee bit on the helplines. I'm just wondering what role you, you, you think it, it might perform. Do you think it would be a source of medical advice uh, or act as a counselling service or, is, or just to signpost people to, to, to various sources of support? Um, I think at the moment the discussions about that are still ongoing, but I think it would have to be a combination. Um, I mean, some, you know, people are sometimes very, very distressed and so they need to help because uh, I think the Samaritans, for instance, have been really quite overwhelmed with this problem, um, but they don't have the expertise to, to help people. And there isn't really, at the moment, there's nowhere to signpost people to anyway. Um, so, so, so do you foresee specialist training for, for, for something like that? Yes, there certainly would have to be specialist training, yeah. but it could be centralised, you know, there's, there's, there are... There's helplines that have been running in England. There's nothing in Scotland, but there have been helplines running in England for um, a, a, a quite a long time, you know, I think about 20 years. But um, some of them are closed down uh, due, due to lack of funding. Um, there's one in Oldham, um, Barry Haslam, sent in, he was one of the, um, he sent in one of the submissions. He's been, he, was, he helped to set up one in Oldham, which has been, uh, replicated in other places in the in the northwest of England. Um, is it widely used, to your knowledge? Is it yes. Oh, and there's one in Bristol, mm -hmm. which is um, they're quite overwhelmed. People can't get through to them. Okay. Um, you know, there's a there's a huge need, and there's a huge need for a really, you know, properly resourced and um, with with really good information that the doctors will believe, because at the moment, even if people say they've phoned a helpline and the helpline advised them something or other, and they go back to the doctors and the, the doctors say, well, they don't know anything about that. It doesn't say that in the guidelines. So more crossover, more you know, yes, cooperation yeah, between the two. Yes, absolutely. It needs yeah. to be, this needs to be something that the, you know, that the medical profession Can co feed collaborates yeah. with mm -hmm. and believes in as well, because it's hopeless. If the, if the patients are getting good, well, hopefully good advice from somewhere and going back to the doctors and saying, I've been advised, for instance, tapering advice. Quite often, they get good tapering advice, advice from one of the. Um, it's usually one of the online advice um, bodies, and they go back to the doctor and say, "I've been advised this," and the doctor says, "Well, my guidelines don't say that. You just, and, okay. and I suggest you do this." Uh -huh. And uh -huh. So there's a disconnect. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Angus McDonald. <coughs> okay.
Okay, thanks, Convener. Um, good morning, Marion. Uh, following on from that, uh, another of the BMA's recommendations calls on each of the UK government's relevant health departments and local authorities to establish adequately resourced specialist support services for prescribed drug dependence. Um, can you perhaps expand on, on what, in your view, adequately resourced specialist services should look like, uh, in addition, perhaps, to helplines and the website that you mentioned earlier? I think we're still in quite early stages of trying to, to figure out what exactly that would be. And again, I think the collaboration um, would be, with the BMA has been talking to the, the charities that have been running support uh, and, and helplines and so on. So I think there'd be a lot of, there's a lot of expertise there that I think they would um, work, work with. But again, you know, this is early in the process, it would be a collaboration between everyone speaking to everybody else and trying to work out what was needed. But, um, I mean, at the moment, people are just left in the long grass really suffering. The, you know, you've read the accounts of people, there's, there's just nothing. There's no, there's no support. They're, they're just left, and, and nobody believes that they, what's wrong with them. No. OK, thank you. Maurice Corey. Um, good morning, Marion. And um, I, I know of your work in Helensburgh, my hometown and my, and my region, so, so I'm well aware of the good work you do with the recovery and renewal in Helensburgh, um, and it's a great benefit to the area. Uh, can I just ask, the BMA's recommendations also call on professional bodies to offer guidance uh, on tapering withdrawal management. Are you aware of any work being done on the development of such guidance? I think, again, it's in early stages, but be be because the problem hasn't been recognised by the medical profession, there's been... it's. You know, nobody's done the research, nobody's really done anything about it except hope it would all go away. So, but there is some research being done now, um, and I think I think there will be more research. We'll, we'll, but uh, one thing we're quite um, we'd like to say is that, that there is a lot of expertise within the self-help groups. These are like Facebook groups and internet groups. The patient self-help groups have developed a huge amount of expertise. And they will be able to share that, you know, as long as there's the willingness for them to share, they can share what they've learned. And, and they've been helping real people through real processes. And, and so there's been, you know, a lot of coming and going and, and supporting each other. So I, th I think there's, you know, there's a lot of expertise there if it's recognised that, that, that would be able to, again, in a collaborative way, if everyone would, would, were able to talk to each other, would be, would be able to be developed. And you find that it's sort of helping your, your work in the Recovery and Renewal Centre? Well, we don't, we don't have a centre, in fact. Well, I mean, sorry, the, yeah, work. The sorry, renewal, could, could sorry they're, in, they're covering your work that you do, that you're involved in. Well, we found it real difficult because what happens is people are struggling desperately with the medications. Mm. The doctors aren't helping them. Um, well, the doctor's advice often is, you know, they're finding it unhelpful to them. Um, and, I mean... It's really hard because we, we the recovery and renewal when we first started up in 2013, we approached the local doctors um, and we said would they be, you know, we told them what we were doing. We asked them if they would be interested in, in, in coming to speak to the group or, 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 or whatever. Um, and they, we heard nothing. So we've kept writing to various people and we keep getting nothing. The response is nothing. The response is this blank. So everywhere you go in the medical profession you get this blank response. Um, so we've been we've been trying to help people. We've been signposting to the help to the you know the sort of charities and the Facebook groups and the, um, the survive, there's a, a, a a website called Surviving Antidepressants and another one called uh, Benzo Buddies and there's you know that they've they've been going for years and uh, you know they've built up a huge knowledge and experience but they're just you know they're, they're not funded, they're, they're self-help groups, basically. Okay, thank you, Karina. Thank you, Good morning. You mentioned in your evidence that many people appear to have been, uh, have taken prescribed medication for many years when, in fact, the use was intended uh, for short term. It would appear from the many submissions we've received from patients that they consider this practice has harmed their health. What do you think could be done by the Scottish Government to better monitor prescribing practice and raise awareness of the issues? Well, I think the first point is really raising awareness of the issues. Um, as, as far as prescribing practice goes, you know, once, once the issues are recognised and taken into account, then I think that will begin to, you know, this, this whole thing of feeding back 
um, that will begin to help things to change. But I mean, I, I think that's really for the Scottish government. I mean, I, I, I can really only speak for the, for the public perception of what's happening. Um, I, I think I would have to. I don't think really that's for us to to, to help with. I think that um, I mean, the suggested overuse of, of prescribed drugs and perhaps leading to uh, sort of the changing of, of people's personality can lead to a, a lack of a decision uh, or a good decision making process and I wonder in the current system uh, of prescription um, does, do you think that, that that then leads to the ability of patients to stockpile prescribing drugs and that coupled with that um, uh, impaired decision making process is exacerbating the problem? Are we sort of going on to more sort of misuse? No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking more the, the way that, that, that uh, these drugs are prescribed uh, and, and the lack of control by uh, perhaps the, the medical profession is allowing, you know, allowing that uh, poor decision-making process by in fact taking those drugs uh, to, to exacerbate a health problem with, uh, with de I'm, antidepressants. I'm not sure that I could really give an opinion on that. Um, okay. No, that's okay. okay. Yeah. Kate? Yeah, I just want to the record that I'm here on behalf of a constituent at her request who I know had hoped to be here, Joanna Dennison, but who is unable to be here. And I believe you've all got her personal testimony anyway, so I just wanted to put that on the record for her on her behalf. As I said um, earlier, we are very appreciative of the personal um, submissions that people have made. I think they've given us a, an idea of some of the really quite important issues that have been flagged up by yourself. I wondered, you spoke about the all-party parliamentary group in Westminster and whether you've explored the possibility of a cross-party group with MSPs here to deal with these, yes, to highlight it, these it was, issues. I think Jackie Bailey raised something, um, I think it was back in 2013, it was soon after we started up the group. We've been involved with Jackie Bailey um, right, right the way through and she, she knew about it and, and she came to one of our meetings and she did contact it contact um, the, I think there is already a Scottish a cross party group for, for something quite similar isn't it mental health issues or something well, there's uh, quite a range of them we would maybe have to look at the words but there may be some I mean I think very specific <laughs> questions around prescribed drug dependence yeah, it might be a subset of some but I think you made the distinction between the misuse of drugs and being prescribed drugs and being there for dependent on them, which I suppose is slightly, it's a different, slightly different issue. Because we did, uh, we did ask her to explore that, and then we, and and it came back. I th there was a, a letter came back that said that they they didn't think it was something that was necessary. Or so perhaps the petition itself may generate an interest in it, and then that would be something that um, could be looked at. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions that people have. And we do appreciate very much again um, your evidence and the very substantial evidence we received in written form on a question which I think there is a dilemma, which is, well, first of all, the appropriateness of prescribing particular drugs at all, um, prescribe them for longer periods of time than perhaps were attended. Are there some drugs that ought not to be prescribed at all or should be discouraged? And the extent to which the medical profession are then are alive to people's concerns when they feel they have become dependent. And we're all, we'll all have been in circumstances where we've raised questions and the response has been, well, it's a clinical decision, which clearly is very difficult to argue with. So um, I, think, I think you've really obviously raised a number of important points. But what we now need to decide is how we want to take this petition forward. When people have views. Brian? Yeah, I, I think the, the thing for me is, is the, um, as you've alluded to, is it's not the prescribing of the drugs per se here, if I'm, if I'm, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the length of time uh, that those drugs are then, are then prescribed for and what what's in place, you know, if, if, if a drug's supposed to be there for a short period of time, what's in place for the medical profession then to uh, to, to change that, that type of service? And I think the only thing I can think of really is, is you know, is to maybe ask the government, write to the government to ask what their view is on, on this particular pe pe petition. I think we should set that would be a good starting point to the Scottish Government, because they would also then take advice from the Chief Medical Officer. Um, I don't know whether there are kind of patients' organisations other than your own, whether people who are dealing with mental health issues are seeing people coming through who have had this particular 
concern. I don't know whether there are organisations. Well, you, you mentioned Samaritans, for example, who may have evidence around the, the scale of the problem that they're they're facing, or Sam H or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just going to say. I mean, it, it's clear that the BMA is aware that there is a problem. I mean, you know, there's there's no denying that mm -hmm. that, that there's a there's a huge issue. So it's it's just a question now of, of of taking it forward. And certainly from our point of view, writing to the government, our government would be the, the first step. Good start point, Brian. No, I just I just I was going to say, on, on, moving on from Rona's point. I mean, if the BMA are aware of the problem. I think I'd like to understand why the problem exists, if there's, if there's something underlying within you know, uh, professional existence, whether or not we need to go any further than write to the government at this point. Or mm -hmm. writing to well, might I suggest that we, we do write to the Scottish Government and they will obviously be, they would be taking information from the Chief Medical Officer. I think it might be worthwhile exploring with Sam H, Samaritans and other organisations, like whether they're aware of this as a, um, an issue. We have had a petition in the past, of course, where there was tragic circumstances where a young woman was prescribed um, her first um, surgery visit was prescribed drugs, which she, she then um, sadly died. So they were very aware of the individual tragic circumstances in another petition around this. So, and I think that's a kind of a, an issue that you would want to maybe tease out further around the appropriateness of a of prescribing the drugs in the first place and then managing dependence at a, a later stage. Morris? Yeah, yeah, I, mean, yeah, I just want to also maybe bring this issue to attention to the UK um, a parliamentary group for, for, for prescribed drug, drug dependence, which you mentioned earlier on. I think that's something, because we might as well benefit from, yeah. the, from the larger area of... Yeah, and you may have been in touch. It, it, might be worth, it might be worth um, just just evidence, contacting yes. them and just seeing you know, where have they been Absolutely. Um, with this issue. Yes, and you, well, we've been involved with them as well, so okay. we, you know we know them. We've been working yeah. with them, and Good perhaps next. ask the BMA for an update on where they have got to with their recommendations around the helpline. Okay, I think that's a, a, a reasonable first stab, but I, I think what's been a very important petition. Can I thank you again for your attendance? Obviously, once we have responses from Scottish government and other organisations, this petition will, will be back on the agenda um, in the next term. Can I thank, thank you very, very much. much. And I can thank suspend you. the meeting until I change over our witnesses. Call meeting back to order. The next new petition we will take evidence on is petition 1653 by Michaela Jackson on behalf of Goldbridge Community Development Trust on active travel infrastructure. We're joined this morning by Michaela and she's accompanied by David Defew and David French, who are both members of Spokes, which I think is a Lothian um, cycling campaigning group. 
Uh, can I welcome you all to the meeting and invite Michaela to make an opening statement of up to five minutes, and then we'll move to questions from the committee. And I should also welcome Christine Graham, who, MSP, who has an interest in this petition. Michaela. Hello. Thank you very much for having us this morning. Um, I, uh, I'm going to be joined by Dave Defu, who's going to be talking about policy issues, and David French, who's also going to be helping me present, um, and he's going to be talking about the issues with option B for the share for roundabouts. Um, I started this petition when it became clear that the option chosen for the share for roundabout was really the worst option with regards to um, accessibility for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the, <coughs> the issues... Uh, sort of, I think, also extend to broader transport policy, which I feel is at odds with um, two key policy objectives within the Scottish Parliament. The first is um, CAPS, or the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland. Um, that's an action plan that was initiated in 2010 uh, with a vision to see 10% of all journeys in Scotland taken by bicycle. Now, a recent review has indicated that there's only been a 0.2% increase in cycling journeys. And at this rate, it would take more than 300 years to reach our 10% goal um, of a 10% cycling goal. So it's clear that transport policy at present isn't integrating cycling or active travel enough. Cycling and active travel have to be central to policy, not an add-on at the end. The second... Um, Scottish objective that I feel um, is at odds with with um, cycling is is climate change. Um, Scotland has really really ambitious climate uh, CO two emissions reductions targets, and um, when reading through the environmental report, the environmental analysis of the share of whole roundabout, I was really surprised to see that climate change. Um, with regards to how the the the, the construction was was Im implemented and how that was going to be used wasn't really a consideration. All the the, the key considerations were really um, the the actual environment and and journey saving times. Um, so so I feel that we need to we need to look at how. Um, how what we build impacts users. If we build for traffic and cars, we're going to get more traffic and cars. If we build for people, for places, we're going to get more people, better places. Uh, what I'm asking today is for active travel not to be an add-on, but to be absolutely integral to, to any new... Um, any new transport infrastructure, especially with regards to trunk roads and key areas for commuting. I'll pass over to David. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'll spend two minutes outlining some policy issues. As Michaela said, the government's preferred Sheriff Hall option B is the worst option for cycling and walking, making it impossible to include a direct pedestrian cycle bridge and with numerous slip road crossings. The government's option B announcement did not even mention cycling. Sestran, the Regional Transport Authority, in its report, Strategic Cross-Boundary Cycle Development, identifies the importance of a bridge here if there is to be high-quality cycle provision. Sustrans, the Scottish Government's main partner on cycling infrastructure, states in a letter to the designers that this option is so poor that they will not comment on its details and they instead urge a rethink on the options. Even the Scottish Government, in a letter to Spokes, damns option B with faint praise, merely saying it is better than existing arrangements. In 2004, Scottish ministers allocated £800,000 to Midlothian Council for a cycle bridge here. Sadly, the cash was subsequently reallocated because at that time it appeared that the roundabout rebuild was moving up the agenda. More generally, the Scottish Government does have a trunk roads cycling initiative policy, which will particularly interest Mr Whittle and um, Mr Corrie, as this policy was introduced by Lord James Douglas Hamilton back in 1996. Um, it is still current, and it commits the government to give special consideration for cyclists in trunk road improvements, ensure no hazards to cyclists are built in, and ensure that opportunities for cyclists are exploited. This policy is clearly breached by the choice of option B. Finally, 
Option B reflects a general issue in the treatment of walking and cycling in infrastructure projects, of which I have countless examples. Namely, major decisions are taken, and only then do designers try and fit in active travel, although good options may by then be impossible. Instead, cycling and walking should be essential criteria from the outset, and holistic solutions should be developed. Finally, pass over to David. Hi, I'm just going to talk um, briefly about Sheriff Hall itself. So Sheriff Hall is an important road intersection, but it's an equally important barrier at the moment between Midlothian and Ed Edinburgh for pedestrians and cyclists. Crossing the current roundabout is really not a fun experience, and that's whether you take the pavement and cross the carriageways or if you cycle around the roundabout itself. Neither is very fun. So the building of a new roundabout is a great opportunity to fix this and to make active travel between Midlothian and Edinburgh at Sheriff Hall an appealing option. The, current, the proposed option B doesn't manage this. Um, as Dave said, improving safety at Sheriff Hall for non-motorised users is not a particularly high bar to clear, but I'm not convinced the proposed design even manages that. The assessment report asserts that safety for non-motorised users will be improved by grade separation, but crossing the slip roads will still be dangerous, especially if the crossings aren't signalised. The nearby straight injunction is already grade separated, but it's listed as by Sustrans recently as one of the very worst accident spots in the country. What we really need is segregated routes across Sheriff Hall. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're obviously interested in the specifics of the um, of Sheriff uh, Hall, but obviously we want to look at the more general issues as well. And th thank you that some of these have already been flagged up. Um, can I just ask Ron Mackay, first of all? Yes, thank, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Your, your petition calls for active travel considerations to be incorporated into all new major in infrastructure projects, and we know that there's disagreement over the, to the extent of which this has already been achieved, and that's and how we measure the provision and quality of the of the infrastructure. Um, I wonder if you have any suggestions for how the provision and quality of active travel infrastructure can be objectively measured. Is there a widely acknowledged standard or guidance that you're aware of that can be drawn on for this purpose to make any comparisons? Or? I don't know. I'm not an expert, but myself personally, um, if I feel like I can take my children along the path, I feel like that's a safe path for active travel. I myself do not define myself as a cyclist. I'm just trying to <laughs> get from me to be and get some exercise into my day. But I'll take higher risks. You know, I'll travel on busier roads that I would never dream of taking my children on. So um, for me, that's the benchmark, is would you take a, 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 an eight-year-old child on that road? I don't know what Spokes has. Um, well, no, I don't know details myself, but I do know that... Um, when the Scottish Government or Transport Scotland was consulting on the options for a Sheriff Hall roundabout, Sustrans did a very detailed analysis um, of the different options based on various criteria, and we could provide that um, letter from Sustrans if it, if it was helpful. Did, did, you, did you get an explanation of why this particular option was chosen over the others? So, I mean, I've just looked at the report, uh -huh. the environmental assessment, you know, the assessment report, and basically there's a kind of model called STAG or, or something similar where different criteria are put into the model. But the problem with that model is it's using, um, it's extrapolating data from like 2014 um, to 2024 when the roundabout will be put into existence. <coughs> and then it's looking at the impact that that will have on... Um, on journey times, on safety, and on the local environment. But at no point does that model... Uh, uh, I feel like we can't be using models that extrapolate from 2014. We need to be looking at where we want to be in 2024. We can't just assume that traffic's going to increase by 40%. Already, transport is the highest greenhouse gas... Um, the highest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions um, in Scotland. We've got to look at how to hold that back, how to decrease the level of traffic, how to improve. We, we can't just kind of like be tinkering around the edges of the system we have now. We need to look at creating a different system that supports actively different method, methods of getting from A to B. I, I just feel it's, you know, 
we, we can't build this sort of hard measure into our society when we're looking for long-term change. Do you think there's merit in looking at, towards some of the European infrastructures which and looking for best practice there, you know, that they've been, they've been uh, working I mean, for some yeah, time. Undoubtedly, yeah. the, you know, it's not, there's not a kind of, it's not a very difficult problem to solve because there's lots of other countries that have solved that problem. Copenhagen has 50% of their um, people on their streets are, are, are on bicycles. You know, we have... Mm -hmm. I think it's also the level of priority that's given to walking and cycling in these decisions. Um, I mean, there are the obvious reasons. Michaela's mentioned climate change and public health, obviously very important. But in terms of government policy, um, the government has a very clear objective that 10% of all journeys should be by bike in 2020, which is incredibly difficult to meet now, if not impossible. But at least we want to work towards it. Um, and yet they have no, no policy to increase journeys by car. And yet here we have decisions being taken where the car um, convenience and time savings are given much greater priority than walking and cycling. And um, similarly, if you look at the overall um, Scottish Government transport policy, which is in the National Transport Strategy, there's a very clear statement of their vision for the future of transport, which is a culture where fewer journeys are made by car. That's the actual quote. And yet here we are taking decisions which are increasing car journeys and making walking and cycling more difficult. OK, thank you. Thank you, thank you Brian Whittle. Uh, good morning. Um, the Scottish Government has published a long-term vision for active travel in Scotland to 2030. The vision includes the aspiration that main roads into town centres all have either segregated cycling provision or high-quality, direct, safe and pleasant alternatives. Pedestrian and cycle paths are in place. Rural and suburban minor roads have low speed limits linking nearby communities and services, so opening up new travel opportunities and choices. Have you had a chance to review this strategy? And do you have any thoughts on the Scottish Government's vision? I'm thinking really around, is, is the policy integrated and, and, and will it lead to the desired outcomes uh, as stated in the policy? Um, I, I've, I've briefly looked over it and um, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> I, I agree with everything in that vision. I just feel like it's a little bit like CAPS. Um, you know, they have these amazing visions and we have a, a incredible targets that we're hoping to meet with regards to climate change as well, but we're not actually putting the policies in place to achieve these visions. And that's where I feel that there's a disjointed... Um, there's no cohesion, everything's siloed. So we have good visions on individual things, but we don't look at how to implement them and join them up with transport, with education, with health. And that's that's the issue that I have. I mean, I think the document's great. <laughs> it's not, but it's not, there's no, there's no clear indication as to how the money going to be put, you, you know, how it's, it's not, um, there's not enough practical indication of exactly how that's going to be achieved. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the, the first point you mentioned from that was the um, provision of segregated routes <clears throat> on main roads, etc., which we think is absolutely critical for the future. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of um, inter-authority cycle routes, such as Sheriff Hall's good example, Midlothian to Edinburgh, um, <clears throat> that's a case where it's really important to have segregated provision. And I, I believe I'm right in saying that your manifesto um, for the Scottish Parliament included segregated routes in every city in Scotland. Um, the problem that we have with segregated routes between authorities is that, quite understandably, each local authority wants to invest its cycle funding within its area of greatest population. So there's less money for routes between authorities. And um, in the old, well, some years ago, the regional transport partnerships used to have capital funding, um, but that was removed by, by this government when they first came to power. Um, and as a result of that, there's now a lot less money available for inter-authority cycle routes. We, um, when Sestran, when it used to have capital funding, had allocated £4 million for routes between Edinburgh and Midlothian, East Lothian, etc. That was all lost um, when, when the capital funding was scrapped. One project that did survive was the A90 cycle route, which goes from Edinburgh to the Forth Bridge to Fife. 
and that was completed about two years ago and has been incredibly successful. I don't have figures with me, but Edinburgh Council, I'm sure, could supply them a, a major increase in commuting into the city through that. And as far as Sheriff Hall in particular is concerned, Sestran has pointed out that the existing biggest flows of cycling between Edinburgh and surrounding areas is between Edinburgh and Midlothian. So it's a particularly important corridor. And with regards to Sheriff Hall, I know that Midlothian Council is planning on a bit of a sort of cycle highway between um, the Sheriff Hall roundabout and the Tesco Harden Green roundabout. I don't know if you know the area, and then between Harden Green and Esk Bank. I think they were really keen to get that's actually quite wide road to properly segregate that. So I feel like, you know, having something properly implemented in Sheriff Hall could be a Kickstarter for other really exciting. Um, developments to support commuting into Edinburgh and journeys within Midlothian are actually really challenging um, uh, in the in the Midlothian transport um, report it, it, it stated itself that it's very difficult to get say from west to east in Midlothian by tra public transport so you know it would support connecting Midlothian as well. Got it. Thank you. Good, good morning to all. Um, the committee is aware that some local authorities have adopted active travel uh, action plans. Are you aware of whether this is widespread and do you consider uh, the Scottish Government should promote these initiatives? Um, yes, I believe that in the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland it's, I don't know whether it's actually a requirement, but it's a very strong request to all local authorities to do that. And some um, money and resources have been put via Cycling Scotland into assisting local authorities with drawing up these plans. So I believe that process is underway. I'm not quite sure what stage it's reached, but Sustrans, I'm sure, could advise on that. Sorry, Cycling Scotland could advise on that. Okay. I mean, I, I deal with um, the Midlothian Active Travel Transport Officer quite closely, and um, they have tiny pockets of money. <laughs> to, to, so a lot of them are for soft measures like, um, y you know, having cycling days to try and get people out and get their bikes fixed. And in fact, the transport officer him said, said the focus, himself said, they're focusing on um, commuting to work by bike. And so, you know, he himself is trying to like, go along with people and show them the best routes to get to their work and stuff. I mean, so the budget is, there's a, there's, a, there's a small amount of money, but it's so small that it's really relying on almost like one person's single vision and a lot of soft measures. There are some hard measures about to be implemented. I think there's plans along certain parts of the railway, which is, that was a key missed opportunity with regards to being able to implement really good um, active travel infrastructure. Um, but the, the small pockets of money that come every now and again, <laughs> and, and, and instead of actually connecting roads, what they do is they just kind of have a path that's already there and kind of pave it over and maybe make it, but, but actually the problem with these is that people don't know about them. You know, there's like a path behind in Mayfield, like um, by the Shell garage that it's impossible to see. I only know because he told me. <laughs> so. Um, if I could, could I just follow yeah, up quickly on that? Um, some years ago, the committee will presumably know there were regional trans there were regional councils rather than the present setup, and that meant that um, because the councils were much bigger, it was possible to set up expertise within each council on walking and cycling. And Lothian Region, for example, had a fantastic cycle team. When the um, regional councils were split up, Edinburgh was fine because it's still a fairly large local authority, but Midlothian, West Lothian, East Lothian all basically lost nearly all their expertise. <clears throat> and I think this is another place where regional transport authorities could really help considerably. And I know Sestran is trying to work on that to be able to build up regional expertise and provide assistance to all the smaller local authorities. Um, who just don't have the resources for it. I mean, that doesn't help with the capital funding, but it provides the expertise, which is the other, other side of the coin. Really, can I just a short one? Follow on from that, you've asked, answered half my question. I mean, what involvement have SUS Trans had in this particular, well, reference to the option B and other options? Um, <clears throat> this is SUS Trans as opposed to SESTRAN. Oh, sorry, right, okay. Yeah, because yeah, I was talking about SESTRAN. SESTRAN, all oh, right, okay. SESTRAN in relation to the expertise for right. small local authorities. But in relation to Sheriff Hall Roundabout specifically, um, Sustrans has paid a great deal of attention to that. They did a very detailed assessment of the original options. 
And um, as I said in my opening statement, they have said with regard to the option which the government has chosen as its preferred option, um, they have said that this option is so poor that they're unwilling to comment on the details and they feel the government should rethink which option it's going for. Right, okay. Thank you. Thanks, can we just follow on from that last point? Have Sustran told the government that they're unwilling to comment? <laughs> um, yes, they've well, they've written a letter which um, is, is publicly available. Uh, it's a letter to, I don't know how you pronounce it, AECOM, e -E -E who are the um, consultants which the government has taken on for the design. So this is a letter from Sustrans to ECOM, um, which is publicly available. That's, that's great. Um, a key part of your uh, petition is about the, the consultation process and how this feeds into the development of infrastructure projects. Do you have any suggestions as to, to how the Scottish Government could achieve a higher standard of uh, public consultation on active travel infrastructure? I, don't, I mean, personally, I don't feel it's the consultation. I feel like there was a consultation, and I know that um, Robert was there, and he said he felt listened to and heard. And obviously, Sustrans have had their input, and Spokes have had their input. So, so these people have been heard and listened to by the Scottish Government. But I feel like, despite that, priority is given then to the STAG model, which says, you know, this is going to create this amount of time, uh, journey time saving. Um, but they, that STAG model doesn't look at, for example, if we increase cycling by, you know, 10%, for example, how will that, in, how will that decrease congestion? What will that have? What will the impact um, to the local economy be by increasing cycling? What will the, you know, what will the CO2 emission savings be from that? So I feel like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that model in itself, but it needs to be a lot broader and it needs to take into consideration, you know, different criteria. It's very narrow at the moment. I mean, um, I, you know, I have a master's degree, we did environmental assessment methods, and I feel like there's just nowhere near enough of that in that model. Okay, and, and just following on from that, um, uh, do you know whether figures of surveys of active travellers regularly feed into infrastructure projects in Scotland in general? Uh, and do you have any suggestions for how the Scottish Government could source that data? Uh, I know Dave mentioned um, sharing detail from Sustrans earlier. Um, I, I mean, I, I would look to Sustrans, but I don't. Um, I'm not sure. Local authorities do collect some data, but I'm not sure how consistent it is between authorities. Yeah. And Edinburgh, for example, has a lot of automatic traffic counters, which count cycling as well as motor traffic. But I, I don't know the position in local authorities in general. But with regards to academic literature, there's a, a, you know, a plethora of um, research that states that the more, in fact, for something like um, the more roads you create, the more traffic you know, there's, there's actually a direct correlation between the length of road and the amount of cars that will then use that road. And there's also clear evidence that by providing active travel infrastructure like segregated cycle paths, you will then get an increase in cycling. So it's not, you know, basically, you know, there's, there's lots of literature and there's, there's lots of literature about economic benefits um, as well. For, for creating the payback, the payback's very short. I know people, are, oh, transport budget's quite tight, but the payback's short. <laughs> okay. Can I just follow up um, on the question of how big decisions are taken? Um, there is, there does seem to be this general feeling amongst designers and decision makers, etc., that you can take the big decisions on a project and then you'll be able to fit in walking and cycling after that. Um, but as I said in my introduction, you know, often your big decision then rules out the best option. And the best, by far the best example of this that I can give you is the Edinburgh tramline system. Um, as you'll know, there's been a great number of injuries. 250 injuries um, have been seen at the Edinburgh hospitals. It's been a recent death, possibly implicating the tramlines. Um, and a lot of the problems are to do with the layout of the tram lines. We made, we made these points when the, 10 or 12 years ago when the layout was being discussed. We even um, brought over an expert from the Netherlands who did a report um, showing how the layout of the tram lines could be made much more amenable to walking and cycling. Unfortunately, that was all turned down. And as a result, um, it's now much more difficult to implement safe um, interaction between 
walking and cycling obviously you can't now change the layout of the tram lines that's that'd be far too expensive and disruptive but if only at the decision making time and the consultants who came over said what you're doing here is you're implementing a tram then you're trying to fit everything around it if we were doing this in the netherlands we wouldn't be implementing implementing a tram we'd be looking at tram bus walk cycle how does the whole thing fit in for maximum safety, maximum convenience for the whole of society? Okay, thanks, that, that's a helpful example. Okay, thanks very much. Now, we are getting very tight for time, but I did promise Christine that she would get an opportunity to ask some questions, but just to be alive to pressures and time. Oh, you love to say that to me as I do in the <laughs> chamber. Um, I know this roundabout like the back of my hand because I travel it regularly, either the A7 or the A6106, and... Um, I have never seen a cyclist trying to navigate it because, as you and I know, the light changes on it happen immediately, and as soon as the light changes for the bypass, the next lane whizzes off, and a pedestrian, I don't think I've ever even seen a pedestrian trying to do it, and I believe cyclists call it the blender, and I'm not surprised. Um, I'm very practical about these things, you know, these models and things like that, but, I mean, the, I'm looking at this picture of the option and the only thing they've done frankly is lift the bypass up and left the original roundabout as it is which currently as we know has lights that switch very rapidly this is no use to cyclists and pedestrians whatsoever and the irony is as you and I know and the other side north and the east and there's actually a cycle path but there's no way of reaching it now my question to you because I asked the minister I've asked him a couple of times I'm looking at a question the 15th of May and I asked him whether he'd make provision for cyclists and this is where I get back suitable provision for all using this cycle is an important part of the proposed improvements to Sheriff Hall Roundabout, and this will be developed in further detail. Now, I've had nothing since, and I, I, my concern is that we're going to get something planted on that's naturally not going to work for you. Given that there's something like this in train, and you're talking about graded lanes, are you also saying you would require, as I think you probably would, lights that change for cyclists and pedestrians and hold the local traffic? Not just the slip roads that go off if you're going the bypass west or the bypass east, but you would need something other than just graded lanes because of the way the light system operates. What's your solution? You're the cyclists. You know better than anybody else. See what everyone wants and what Midlothian was promised is a cycle bridge. Um, unfortunately, with option B, the, the bypass goes over, so you can't have like a bridge over, over the bypass. So that's kind of... Out of the question, so that's kind of out of the way. I mean, it's really difficult because the current option is so poor. What we're doing is we're hammering on something onto the outside. You know, it should be integrated within the design, and I, and lights presumably would be an improvement to the current situation. But I mean, it, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't cycle along um, the straight and roundabout either. No, that's a no, nightmare. I know you know, if too. we're going to just create. A system that, that, that puts further, you, you know, has a barrier but has a sort of minor improvement. You're not going to get people on bikes. We don't need to get cyclists on bikes. We need to get people Other that people. that want to have the opportunity. We need to get the, the lady that works in radiology at, at the uh, at Little France to get on her bike, you know, because she feels like that's a safe journey and she won't have to sit in traffic. We don't need, to, you know, the brave cyclists, they'll do it. You know, my husband will do that, but it's the normal people that need support. And so, so yeah, as much support as you can give them, presumably lights, but ideally not something tacked on at the end. We, we wanted okay. a, a proper if you were crossing. to tear this up and say, we do have to deal with the bypass traffic because it's enormous, yeah. and separate local traffic from it and also traffic that's feeding yeah. onto the bypass. It's not a bad thing, yeah. What would you have done instead of just having the flyover from the bypass? What would you have had? Well, Option yeah. C, yeah. Yes. Option C. Option yeah. C looked... So I, in the consultation, I criticised it for some minor things, but it was a huge, huge improvement on what's there, huge, huge improvement on options A and B, because you could cycle from Dalkeith to Edinburgh without crossing the A720 or the A7 or things. I, I have cycled around Sheriff Hall. I consider myself a fairly confident, brave cyclist. <laughs> It's terrifying. Of course it is. Um, it took me, I took the pavement the last time I went there, it took me three minutes to go round a roundabout. 
because you have to stop and wait for a gap in traffic, which isn't always obvious. Drivers don't indicate when they're coming off the slip roads. <laughs> they're going terrifyingly fast. I'm a brave. Lanes. They I, don't, you know, they're switch cyclists. <laughs> I'm a brave, confident cyclist, and I'm terrified. We should be building infrastructure which people are happy to take an eight-year-old across, or somebody, an, an eighty-year-old should be happy cycling across, or people in wheelchairs should be able to go across. Yeah, yeah, this is not it. Just as a final point, could be very tolerant if you just say what option C is. Yes, yeah, so option C involved moving the roundabout half a mile west and then using the old roads, the, the current A7, A6106, and putting cycle lanes on them and then building a bridge over the A720 to the east of the new roundabout. I see. Um, and so it, was, it, was, it would have been great. This is going to be an issue that's alive politically and, and the Minister will be questioned, but specifically around the petition and what we do with it. And can I thank you very much for um, all the evidence you've given us today. It's been very useful. I wonder if members have comments or suggestions for further action. I think we want to take the petition forward around this whole question of planning ahead um, and not bolting it on afterwards when it then becomes difficult. Brian? Okay. Convener, I would be really interested to hear uh, government feedback uh, on this particular plan and, and, and re the reasons why they've gone with this option. Okay, so we're going to contact the Scottish Government. Can we call it even press on Christine's question? That's, she's not really had much feedback from no, okay. <coughs> Make sure they're catered for yeah. and not yeah. actually practical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it may be that we, I mean, in, in consultation with the clerks, we can see whether it would be actually worthwhile getting the Scottish Government Minister in, uh -huh. um, as opposed to just simply being correspondence. But we can look at that. Are there other we mentioned Sustrans? We Sustrans, might want to. Yeah, Sustrans. And also, uh, I mean, uh, get more emphasis on option C, which has been emphasised yeah. okay. specifically. Um, could I just make one? In the um, report produced by the clerk to the committee in the conclusion section, it recommends writing to various bodies seeking their views on the petition. Could I just suggest we add to that, seeking their views on the petition, both in respect to transport projects in general and specifically on the Sheriff Hall roundabout? So well, there's two, two issues, transport. I appreciate that, but yeah. I would need to take advice on whether as a petition committee we can deal with very individual, very focused projects. Right. So it might be in the context of that we would ask the Minister about that project, but we can we can yeah. check that one out in the class. I'm sure we're happy to give us advice. Is it Angus? Yes, thanks, Convener. I think given the, the nature of the petition, we should also contact en Environmental Link, which is... Uh, the umbrella body for a number of NGOs and perhaps WWF as well, because I know they have strong, very strong views with regard to the current uh, situation. Okay, I think these are a, a number of um, issues that we can and highlight, and we'll, we'll your direct question about whether we can seek views on the specific as well as the general, and um, we'll certainly come back to you on that. But can I thank you very much for your attendance, and I can suspend the meeting to allow witnesses to leave the table.
to, to members that we have a very significant amount of business still to get through and I'm not quite sure we're going to get through it all. We want to make sure that all of the petitions here are treated with respect and that we have enough time to um, reflect on them in a serious way. So it may be an interest of balance between dealing with the petition in a serious way and the pressures of time that there are some of these petitions we won't reach. But I hope that petitioners will understand that is because we want to make sure that the petitions are treated with respect. I can rattle through this in 15 minutes, but I think that's just respectful to the petitioners and to the considerations of the committee. So we'll see how it goes, but um, my, we have to finish at 22, so my expectation is we may not reach particular petitions, um, but they will obviously be rescheduled as soon as we, we return. Um, we're always getting the balance between getting through the business and, of course, making sure that even in taking evidence that we give the petition sufficient time. So we'll see how we, we, we progress. We're now moving to the next petition on the agenda, which is petition 1592 by Shaheen McQuaid. McQuaid, my apologies, on Group B strep information and testing. Members will recall that the UK National Screening Committee's review of the latest evidence and screening for Group B strep was published in March 2017. It has not recommended introducing a national screening programme for this disease. At our last consideration of this petition, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government seeking its view on this decision. It explains that the National Institute of Health Research has been asked to commission a UK-wide clinical trial to compare universal screening for Group B strep against usual risk-based care. The Scottish Government hopes this work will commence as soon as practicable. The Scottish Government also noted that the UK Government Chief Scientific Advisor held two research workshops last year to bring together a broad range of experts on Group B strep from across the UK. It is intended that an outcome paper will be published following these meetings, outlining steps that are intended to aid in reducing the harm caused by Group B strep. We have not had any written submissions from the petitioner, although she has been invited to do so. Nevertheless, I think we can conclude from this that the Scottish Government and UK Government are taking forward measures that will, it is to be hoped, address the issues raised by the petitioner. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on action that we can take. Angus? Can I ask through you, convener, how, um, through, the, uh, through you, convener the clerks, how, how long um, they've been waiting for a response from the petitioner? Right. And I think it's from the beginning. Um, I think we very much appreciate the, the petitioner's submitting the petition, giving us the information, but she has not chosen to respond further, so um, I think that's obviously within her um, entitlement to do so. Absolutely, and, and um, I would congratulate the, the petitioner for um, making sure that this issue was uh, was on the radar, but um, I think, given your earlier comments, convener, um, I would be minded to close the petition under Standing Orders Rule 15.7. Uh, given that the, the UK National Screening Committee has reviewed the latest evidence um, earlier this year and does not recommend screening for Group B streptococcus, but has asked the National Institute of Health Research to commission a UK-wide clinical trial to compare universal screening for GBS against usual risk-based care. What would be the view of the rest of the committee? I think progress has been made, and I think we've gone as far as we as we can with it. But and of course there is always the option for somebody to bring back a further right, petition if they feel yeah. if, yeah. if it's not going anywhere. So uh -huh. I think we are agreeing to close the petition yeah. as outlined um, by Angus, but I think we would want again to reiterate our thanks to the petitioner for the courage she demonstrated in bringing the petition and giving her personal testimony to the committee, which understandably is not easy, but I do think that has shone a light on a very important issue and it's clear that at government level there is an awareness of that. If we can then move on to the next petition, which is petition 1621 on sepsis awareness, diagnosis and treatment, lodged by James Robertson. Members will recall that at our last consideration, we invited the Scottish Government to respond to questions raised by the petitioner with regard to ongoing work and measurements, training programmes and mapping. The Scottish Government has advised that the work on sepsis awareness and management continues within local boards as part of the deteriorating patient's pathway. That work is monitored through national standard performance indicators and is supported by the Scottish Patient Safety Programme team. The Scottish Government advises that training programmes which incorporate sepsis are at Foundation Year 1, where doctors undertake mandatory training sessions. It notes that specific 
sepsis scenarios are included as a mandatory component for all doctors in the advanced life support course and advises that nurses and other healthcare staff are able to access that course. It adds, however, that while these courses are delivered consistently across the entire Scottish healthcare system with the same mandatory components, there is no formal mapping process. The petitioner acknowledges the detail provided by the Scottish Government, but refers to his own personal experience to question the effectiveness of the training. He also notes a recent resolution by the World Health Organisation urging all governments to raise awareness among their public of the symptoms of sepsis. He suggests that the Scottish Government might act on this by launching a national public awareness campaign to be led by NHS Scotland. Members will recall that in its submission in March, the Scottish Government indicated that it would be supportive of any public-facing campaign, which it suggests could be done through its endorsement of existing work being undertaken by charitable organisations such as the Fiona Elizabeth Agnew Trust and by encouraging individual boards to work collaboratively. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. My own view for what it's worth is that I think we should be asking the Scottish Government if they would consider... Um, their own public awareness campaign, given the resource of this, the NHS as a comparison with a small voluntary organisation. I think there's no doubt that the question of public awareness is a really um, big issue. Brian? I would also be quite interested to understand the sort of ongoing CPD process within the, uh, the health board itself. I think a, that, that seems to be a recurring theme that, uh, that, that has come up across a multitude of disciplines within the NHS. So that sort of CBD process seems to be... Uh, a new yeah. um, awareness training amongst the yeah. clinicians. Yes. Angus? Yeah, thanks, Kameen. I think that would be a, a sensible um, course of action, particularly given uh, the recent resolution by the World Health Organisation uh, to launch a global, pub, global public awareness campaign. Uh, on sepsis, so uh, clearly um, we begin to get the Scottish Government's views on, on a Scottish one. Yeah. Okay. Surely. Next on interest, this is a uh, Mr. Roberts is a constituent of mine, and, and um, I just you know I agree with what what we're planning to do. I think it's it's very important that. Um, that there is a Scottish wide awareness campaign. Um, Mr. Robertson thinks that we're doing less here than NHS England is doing. And in view of that, it was less than a month ago the WHO um, launched this global campaign. I think it's um, you know I think it's imperative that we. And he also highlights the his opinion. He's unconvinced of the effectiveness of the training at the moment um, because it's it's not so long since his wife actually died in hospital. Um, Okay. after 17 days with the condition. Okay, I think we, we do want to contact the Scottish Government then to ask um, that it does launch a national public awareness campaign and we would be interested to know why they wouldn't want to do that given the importance of it and the, the, the World Health Organisation point and to ask about this training and, and refresh um, for clinicians. And I think we would also want again to, to thank the petitioner um, for pursuing this issue, which must be still very difficult for time for him because he has such a personal connection and awareness of direct um, impact of this on his own and his family's life. So if that's agreed, um, we can then move on to petition 1623 on unelected church appointees and local authority education committees. This petition is by Spencer Fieldays on behalf of the Scottish Secular Society. The Scottish Government has replied to our questions from our early, previous consideration and has confirmed that it will carry out an equality impact assessment on any policy changes made through its education governance review. It adds that it will address separately any proposals within the petition that are not addressed through its governance review. The Scottish Government has published information on the next steps in its education governance review. This was debated by the Parliament yesterday afternoon. The petitioner welcomes the commitment and clarification provided by the Scottish Government, and I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on how we may take this forward. Angus? Yes, thanks, Commissioner. I think the petition looks to or seems to have done its job, um, given that uh, the Scottish Government has given a commitment to consider the issues raised in the petition as part of the Education Governance Review, uh, and has confirmed that it will carry out an equality impact assessment on any policy changes made through that review. So I would move to close the petition, uh, understanding Re orders rule 15.7. Okay. Views of other members? 
I, I would not close the petition. I think we need to take the second uh, the point about um, let's look at it, let's look at the education reviews, next step documents, etc., and how it pertains to the petition. I think we should keep it open until such times as we have considered that as a, as a committee. The education, the only point I would make, I suppose, the education governance review is very, very massive. It's a big, big and wide ranging document and review. There's a very small part of it. We have a choice. We can close it and the petitioners can come back if they're unsatisfied with what the Scottish Government does in relation to the quality impact assessment, or as we can do as, as Morris suggests and keep it open. Um, I don't know whether other members have a view. I mean, either way, it's not closing the opportunity for the, exactly. the so member to bring it back. Keep it open at this stage. I'm not sure what could be gained by it until we know whether the petitioner's satisfied with the changes in the the governance review. Brian? Oh. You have a view? <laughs> mm. uh, I'm, I'm being Kofi Annan here, uh, sitting on the fence. Um, I've, I've got to be honest, I'm, in, I'm inclined to, to um, I'm inclined to close, I've got to be honest, uh, given that the petitioner has the option to come back again. I think it's always a fine balance, and I think this question of when we close a petition and not is something that you know, shaped the history of the of the um, the petition committee itself. I think we recognise the issues. The Scottish government has said it's going to address it. I think we would then, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity to repetition if they're unhappy with what the the Scottish government has done on this question is open. It may also be that we could just refer. Flag not prefer the petition to the education committee, but flag up to the education committee, who will be scrutinising the response to the government. This has been a particular issue that's been highlighted, and ask them to at least ensure that it's part of their scrutiny. Would that cover it? That's actually, that's actually a good point. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I certainly don't think we should close it. I mean, I, I must stand by my original statement from my experience on the education committees over in the councils. So I'm sorry I didn't agree with the rest, but I, I think yes, it should be flagged up with the education committee. But I, mm -hmm. I stand where I stand. Okay, that's helpful. <laughs> I think on balance, I mean, across, across the committee, we don't agree with you. Um, I think that's my. I think we understand the point you're making, um, but I'm wondering if I think the general view or the majority view is that we do close the petition, Angus. I was just going to say I've also served on education committees at a local authority level, and. Um, uh, I'm pleased to see that the, 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 the Scottish Government have given the commitment to consider uh, the issues raised. Um, so I'm still minded to close the petition. Okay. If you want to push it, we'll just have a vote for the purpose of recording oh, it, Morris. Sorry, I, I do stand okay. by what I say. In that so case, you take that as you wish. In that case, I'm moving that the petition is closed on the basis of what we have said with the reassurance the Education Committee would get the opportunity to, or would have flagged up to him this issue, and the petition may be able to return to a later stage if unsatisfied with Scottish Government. Can you see those in favour of that proposal? Against? Okay, so that's carried. And you've abstained. 3-1, an offence sitter. No, that's entirely within your rights to do so. Look, I think that's, you know, obviously we recognise that there are important issues there, and we would also want to thank the petitioner for bringing this question to the attention of the Parliament and to the Government. If we can then move on to Petition 1626 on the regulation of bus services. The next petition is by Pat Rafferty on behalf of United Scotland. Petition 1626 on the regulation of bus services. The Scottish Government has provided the clarification we sought following our previous consideration of this petition and has advised that improved partnership working and franchising will be elements of the full consultation in the proposed Transport Bill. We have not received a, a response from the petitioners, but can ask members if they have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Again, it would be interesting to uh, find from the Scottish Government when the sort of timescale for um, the consultation on the proposed transport bill and perhaps um, ask them at, at the earliest opportunity to engage with the petitioner. Okay. Angus? Yeah, I, I would agree, Convener. I think we're all keen to see the, the transport bill going through Parliament uh, or its, its Parliament stages mm -hmm. as soon as possible, or sooner rather than later. So, um, clearly, I, 
getting an indicative time scale from the Scottish Government would be of enormous help. Yeah. And a commitment to address the issues that have been flagged up, particularly around like that, you know, the provision of services across but effective bus services across the country, yeah. um, which was obviously raised with us. So it's agreed then that we write to Scottish Government seeking an indicative timetable for its full consultation of the proposed transport bill and tasks that the uh, Government engaged with the petitioners, as Brian has already said. Yeah. Is there any, anybody else? It may be that we also just go back to the petitioner and just... Um, it may be that they've been caught up with so many other different things they've not been able to respond. OK, if we can then move on. To petition 1629, MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers in Scotland. The next petition is petition 1629 on MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers in Scotland, lodged by Jennifer Lewis. We have received submissions from the Chief Medical Officer and the petitioner. The Chief Medical Officer has provided her views on the action called for in the petition, essentially supporting the Scottish Government's views set out in its submission from March, in that the specialist Scottish Optim Ophthalmic Oncology Service follows national guidelines which were accredited by NICE. She explains that it's her understanding that the guidelines will be reviewed in December 2019, but that an intermediate review would be carried out if any new evidence becomes available before then. The petitioner's submission argues that new evidence has already been presented both during the course of her evidence to the committee on 2nd February and also in her submission of 12th April. Her submission is supported by Ian Galloway, who members will recall presented evidence to us alongside the petitioner in February. He notes that in the rest of the UK, if a patient requests an MRI scan, they're able to get it, even if the centre does not offer that facility for first-line surveillance. The petitioner and Ian Galloway also query the information provided by the Chief Medical Officer with regard to research being undertaken on the use of ultrasound for first-line surveillance. They regard this as futile and a backward step when ultrasound is already known to be inferior to MRI. In addition, they note that it could take up to two years for the research to gather sufficient statistically significant data due to the small number of patients and compare the cost implications of the time and resources spent in this research against the additional cost of providing MRI scans. The Chief Medical Officer refers in her submission to a recent Commissioning for Quality and Innovation meeting at which it was agreed that, quote, a UK-wide group would be formed to develop UK-wide guidance and recommendations on surveillance. Ian Galloway indicates that he would wish to understand more about the effect that any UK-wide group could have and would welcome sight of the minutes to get a fuller picture. For her part, the petitioner regards the formation of a UK-wide group as, quote, a potential step in the right direction and can I invite any comments or suggestions from members. I think we have to, you know, probe it further because um, clearly there's still a, a lot of un unanswered questions um, from the response, so from the chief medical officer. So I think, you know, we have to ask the question um, about flexibility. Why some UK centres offer this and will provide MRI scans um, to patients on request? Um, you know, we need a time scale for the formation of the, the UK wide group, um, which is going to undertake the work. And then just the various other points raised by the petitioner, I think we need to probe a wee bit further and get some more answers to. Yes, Morris? Uh, yes, I, I can, I, I'm concerned about the Chief Medical uh, Officer's response to the petition, saying I'm pleased, and it goes on to say, I can only hope that Garton Naval will be proactive. That's not strong enough. Yeah. That is severely concerning to me, uh, and therefore I think we have something more positive to say that. And also, I'd like, I think writing to NICE is going to be a productive way forward as well. Um, so we need, to, we need to get them to button down this. Uh, it's not satisfactory the way it is. Any other views? Is that agreed? I, 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 I think I recall from the petition we found the evidence compelling. Mm -hmm. The MRI scans help, um, help diagnosis and help you know the scale of the problem. And it's not clear why that would be something that wouldn't routinely be offered in Scotland if it's been offered elsewhere. So I think, again, and you know, the points around new evidence and so on are made um, well by the petitioner. So if that's agreed, um, this petition will obviously come back to us when we've got that information. OK, if we can then move on. The next petition on the agenda is Petition 1630 by Fiona Webb on nursery funding for three-year-olds. Members will recall that at our last consideration of the petition, we asked the Scottish Government for an update on its response to the consultation and its plans to expand early learning 
and responds to the cons for it in child care provision in Scotland. This includes a commitment to increase the current entitlement of free early learning and child care entitlement to 1,140 hours. Members will see from the clerk's note that the issue of parents' ability to access the full entitlement for their children was raised when the Minister made his policy statement. The Minister noted that the Scottish Government considers that the current arrangement provides sufficient flexibility to local authorities to provide the entitlement to address the issue. The petitioner has been invited to comment on the Scottish Government's response, but the submission has not been received. I wonder if members have any suggestions or comments um, on how we might take this forward. Right. Yeah. I think this this particular petition and this particular topic is is, is uh, uh, a very interesting one in Parliament. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of toing froing um, been around this one, and, and um, I think, the, I think the, go the government's position has been fairly well stated, um, and I don't think they're of mind to move at this current juncture. Um, and I wonder, therefore, without a further submission from the petitioner, whatever way we feel on this particular topic, whether it's uh, viable to keep the petition open, even though, to me, it's, it's a, a really fundamental issue. I think it's a very live issue here, and people are watching closely the ability of the Scottish Government to implement its childcare strategy, and that, again, as I know, as a member of the Education Committee, we've looked at the planning process around that, and... Um, that will be something I've no doubt that other committees of the Parliament will be looking at. That in the north, it's the kind of issue that will secure parliamentary scrutiny, whether it specifically deals with this issue around um, the third birthday question. Well, that that will obviously be seen. I have replied saying that you know that local authorities do now have the flexibility to, to you know that's it within their discretion to offer entitlement at an earlier stage. So, I mean, I think that's, obviously there'll be a watchful eye kept in it all, but, but um, I, I don't think, you know, I think that's as far as we can go with this petition. I would uh, suggest closing it. So are we agreeing that we would close the petition on the basis the Scottish Government has published an action plan for the expansion of early mm -hmm. learning and childcare in Scotland and has made a commitment to publish an evaluation report of the expansion by the end of 2017. And again, there will be an opportunity for the petitioner sure, to revisit to this back. if they yep. feel that that's mm -hmm. not yep. been addressed. Um, is that agreed then? Agreed. agreed. Okay, agreed. so we're agreeing to close the petition. Can I again thank the petitioner for bringing the petition and highlighting an issue that's clearly of concern and has, has been an issue that's been addressed in Parliament, not just in the Petitions Committee itself. Okay, if we can then move on. The next item on the agenda is Petition 1632 by Amanda MacDonald and Concessionary Transport for Carers. Members will recall at our last meeting we agreed to seek the view of a number of stakeholders. The carers' organisations that responded agreed with the petitioner that many carers face financial difficulties in affording transportation. They have provided figures to the Scottish Government for what they estimate this policy would cost. The Scottish Government explained that the Carers Scotland Act 2016 will place a duty on local authorities to support quote, the identified needs of carers who meet local eligibility criteria. The relevant provisions of the Act will come into force on 1 April 2018. It also outlined a number of measures as taken recently to provide additional support to carers. COSLA explained that local authorities address carers' needs in a targeted way to assist those in the greatest need. COSLA questioned whether the scheme proposed by the petition would be affordable or, quote, represent the most effective way to invest resources to improve outcomes for carers in the greatest need. Members will recall that we agreed to meet informally with the petitioner. Arrangements were taken forward for this meeting, but they had to be cancelled. We were sorry not to have the opportunity but the petitioner has provided a written submission outlining our views in more detail and responding to the submissions received from stakeholders. Ms Macdonald explained that young carers are included in those who save the government an average of £132 billion per year. However, they are not eligible for carers' allowance. Ms Macdonald also noted that many carers do not live with the person they care for, which means their care and related transport costs are not always covered by the comparison the companion card. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on how you might take this petition forward. Brian? I think I, I mentioned the last time this, this was up that I was, I was 
struck when I, I sort of attended an away day for uh, young carers struck by uh, a, a round table discussion that uh, they got to, to question uh, MSPs and boy did they um, and uh, I, I, I was really struck with some of the, pe the, the, the personal and sort of anecdotal evidence of some of the, the, the issues that they face uh, and a lot of it is around uh, around transport even paying for a bus fare to go downtown to pick up a prescription to come back and and it just seems to me that there's, a, that there's, a, there's an obvious solution here. And it's raised by the petitioner, and, and I'm kind of loath to let this one go, I have to say. I think you can see the argument around cost. You can understand Cosler's position, I can understand the Scottish Government's position. But the argument put by the, um, the petitioner around the savings to the public purse from the support from carers is pretty compelling as well. It's just, if we're not going to close it, how are we going to take it forward? What, how usefully can we take it forward? Because he's going to have an argument about costings. Does it make, is, is there something specific that we would be seeking evidence on that would help inform our view? I was really hoping you'd come up with the answer, Convener. <laughs> 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 <I've managed> <laughs> <laughs> Morris? Yeah, I think, um, again, based on experience and uh, chairing the IJB Nagar Butte, this is very much a health care and social care partnership, and they're budgeted accordingly and devolved to that. And I think this is something that's got to be addressed with the local authorities. And I would certainly say that um, if we close the petition as it stands at the moment, I don't think we're closing off the actions of what could happen, because we really need to, The IGBs have only been operational since the 1st of April this year. Uh, and they're getting their act together, if I put it that way. Um, and obviously, this is something I know that's in consideration, and bearing in mind what the young carers are saving, the, 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 the government nationally, as well as local authorities. And I think we just need to give the, um, the, 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 the local authorities the, the, the space to try and implement this. And then maybe it gets revisited by the petitioner again. Another and I years. think due to the fact that we will be having, you know, the Carer Scotland Acts will be enforced by April next year. Um, and that will throw a new, new dimension on it, and there'll be a duty in the local authorities to support the, the needs of carers um, who meet certain criteria. So I, th I think it's, it's ongoing, but I think to keep it open from now till next year, I'm not sure what we could achieve. I agree. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Angus? Yeah, um, clearly the onus is on uh, local authorities, so I would agree with, with Morris and, and uh, Rona that. Um, uh, re reluctantly, um, we should c perhaps close the petition, um, but at the same time monitor how mm -hmm. local authorities are. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, if I were devil's advocate, would yeah. you not argue that it might be the Scottish Government's job to, if we've got a national concessionary um, bus scheme, th the way in which it would be the responsibility of the Scottish Government would be for them to extend the criteria to carers? I mean, there's, an inf there's a natural infrastructure there. That mm. question, of course, is clearly one that the Scottish Government has pushed back on. But that is something, I mean, I think the judgment for the committee is whether we let the petition go in the knowledge that as the carer's legislation is implemented, then there is a question around um, you know, whether this issue is addressed. My sense is that both the Scottish Government and local government have said they couldn't afford it. So they've, they've made it, they've taken a view in the petition. The question is whether we want to push that further, or, you know, is there a place for, is there something that we could, you know, host that would be another kind of round table type thing that we maybe would address this, or would that be taking it too far in terms of, is it so specific an issue that it wouldn't be that broad based view that we'd be looking for? The other way it would be to bring Cosler back to the table here um, and get a sort of viewpoint, bearing in mind that, it, that it's going to have to come out of the budgets of the local authorities. That's the issue. But, but my argument to you is it, the other option for that is that it could be, because the bill says you can have locally determined needs, mm -hmm. there's nothing to stop separately the Scottish Government deciding they're going to expand the concession travel scheme to carers. These two things don't preclude each other. No, but we know realistically... Neither COSLA nor the Scottish Government are going to argue for that on the grounds of cost. No. no I agree. I think it's a national strategy. But at the end of the day, the money that has to pay for that comes from the local authorities. That, that's my point. So there's a crossover between the two, national government and local authority. Mm -hmm. Well, some of it is. Yeah. But the national concession scheme is funded through Scottish Government budgets. Right. To some extent, yeah. Okay. 
talk myself to stand I, I still. Mean, <laughs> the point of next year, I mean, it might, you know, you know, it, it could be revisited in the sense that it would be nice to get an indication of how much it would cost mm. to implement this. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a know. fair point. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. We don't have a ballpark figure from either Cosla or the Scottish Government, so um, it would be good to, to, to get that and see if, can we do see that if it then? is feasible. Or even a criteria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, can we maybe, um, I mean, it would be useful to also to ask local authorities, yeah. realistically, when they say there's an issue of cost, are any of them contemplating this as part of the local provision for carers? And we could do that. Okay, so we will continue the petition um, to establish costs. But, yeah. Okay, if we can then move forward. The next petition is Petition 168 by Sean Clarkin on Local Housing Allowance Bedroom Tax 2. We have received submissions from the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government notes that the petition reflects concerns among stakeholders of the impact of this measure. It says that it shares these concerns and would welcome parliamentary discussion of the issues, but that it would have first require full det details from the DWP of how the policy will be implemented. Members will recall that we asked the Scottish Government for an indication of the extent and limitation of powers available to it within the terms of broader UK policy. The Scottish Government repeats that it is unable to provide a detailed assessment of options available to it until its clarity on UK Government policy. It adds that this extends to any consideration of funding arrangements and that Ministers intend to raise these concerns directly with the UK Government. The Scottish Government was able to provide an update on the research being undertaken in partnership with the Chartered Institute of Housing, attaching the interim report to its submission. That report identifies a number of potential challenges. These are summarised in paragraph 8 of their paper. The submission from ALCO and SFHA support the action called for in the petition and provide some examples of the challenges that may be faced due to additional complexity of the measure. Both submissions identify the measure as more complex than the so-called bedroom tax, making it far more difficult for the Scottish Government to mitigate the impact. The petitioner considers that the submissions demonstrate the concerns that exist about the policy and make it clear about the difficulties in mitigating the impact. He repeats his call for a parliamentary debate on the issue. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions. I, mean, I was certainly very struck by the, by the response from housing organisations in particular, um, the impact for their tenants. Um, an impact on particular groups, including um, single young men, I think they highlight was a particular issue. And I am a bit disturbed at the lack of detail they have. About, I mean, even if we were to ask the Scottish Government to consider mitigating the policy, then actually they don't have the detail in with which they, they can do that. Or the resources, perhaps, convener. I mean, how, how far do we go to, yeah. to mitigate the impacts? You know, there's no bottomless pit with regard to money. I think it would be useful to find out when the Scottish Government want, is going to raise the issue uh, on funding arrangements with the UK Government and, um, you know, to, to tease more detail out on, on, on all that and whether or not it plans to have a parliamentary debate. I mean, it's certainly something, I mean, we've already um, scheduled to uh, requests for debates yeah. from earlier business is something we could certainly look at, although I don't think at this stage we've got enough information for that. No. But I don't know whether the Social Security Committee is something that's looking at this, mm -hmm. whether the Local Government Committee and with Housing is looking at it. Yeah. Um, and I think we would want to be flagging up to the relevant subject committees and asking them whether they've got Absolutely. this focus is on, it on the radar. Mm -hmm. yeah, on, I, is it on, I because, and I think partly because, as we see from the evidence, it's both a substantial issue, but it's quite a technical issue. Yeah. And that for organisations, SFHA and um, ALCO, to be highlighting that would suggest that they're working on it, but whether it's worked its way through into the parliamentary process, we wouldn't be sure. I would ex I fully expect that this would end up as a parliamentary debate. But I think it would be interesting to check with the subject committees whether they're actually exploring this. Um, and, you know, I don't know whether there are um, other issues that we could take forward at this stage. Uh, Brian? No, I was just going to say, um, I, I, I think that if other, other committees are gathering evidence, 
uh, as well. It'd be, I'd be really interested. I'd prefer if it's all to gather that evidence together because, as you see, it's a uh, it, it's quite a complex uh, uh, issue to deal with. I suggest that we also we could write directly to the DWP, asking them where they are in the process, what their timescales are, for the details, and whether they have done an assessment of the impact of their own policy. Um, and if they don't write direct, you know, I, the clerks will give us advice on whether we write to the minister or we write to the department. Um, but that is obviously something that we could take forward. My sense is that we don't want to let the petition go to the relevant yeah, subject yeah. committee at this stage. We would still want to be getting further information about how this is. Now, it may be that in the world of uncertainty that we're living in, this may be one of the things that's fallen off the agenda at UK level, which I think most of us would welcome, but equally it may be something that simply has not got a focus on it, but is being pursued at a departmental level, and we would be want to be, we want to be aware of that as well. Angus? Yeah, um, I think uh, this committee should um, reserve the right to, uh, for the time being to initiate a, a chamber debate yes. if there is no uh, willingness from the Scottish Government to initiate a debate, which I hope there is, mm -hmm. um, but if not, then then we, we should uh, keep that on the agenda. Absolutely. And I, I think that our option for a, um, a, a parliamentary debate would be informed by the further information that we've got. So I don't think we want the... I don't think we would drive a parliamentary debate ahead of that information. No, 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 no. Um, but I certainly think in illuminating this question to the other committees, then we are perhaps creating a trigger for them to be asking these yeah. kinds of questions um, as well. So we're writing to the Scottish Government, we're highlighting it to relevant subject committees, and we're going to contact the DWP directly in terms of, of what they have done. But we, and you know, if there are other housing organisations who have an interest in this and who respond to the petition, we would be, we'd find that uh, very welcome. But I think it is an issue that, again, we appreciate that the fact the petitioner has brought this um, petition forward because it's one of these issues which because of its technicalities, could have ended up not being something that people were, were aware of. OK, so if that's agreed, can we move on to our final petition um, for consideration this morning? It's petition 1643, lodged by Jack Douglas on behalf of NUS Scotland, um, on introducing individual risk-based blood donation in Scotland. The petition calls for a change to the regulations to prevent people from within the LGBT plus community from donating blood and to move to an evidence-based system that examines people on their individual risk to provide blood. Members have copies of the submissions received from the Scottish Government, Scottish National Blood Service. And can I just suspend two minutes? Order, and I'll just start at the beginning of petition 1643 since uh, um, we had to suspend there. So the final petition of consideration this morning is petition 1643 lodged by Jack Douglas on behalf of NUS Scotland on introducing individual risk-based blood donation in Scotland. The petition calls for a change to the regulations that prevent people from within the LGBT plus community from donating blood and to move to an evidence-based system that examines people and their individual risk to provide blood. Members have copies of the submissions received from the Scottish Government, Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service, Terence Higgins Trust, HIV Scotland and the Equality Network. The Minister for Public Health and Sport says that the Scottish Government is very much open to revising the deferral criteria for men who have sex with men and other categories of donors and is sympathetic to the argument that a 12-month deferral period may no longer be necessary for some groups of potential donors given the improvements in blood, testing, blood screening tests. 
The stakeholder submissions also indicate support for a revision of the current rules and deferrals and speculate on potential recommendations coming out of the review conducted by the Donor Selection Working Group of the Advisory Committee on the Safety of Blood Tissue and Organs. The SNBTS submission indicates understanding the working group was due to report earlier this month with subsequent recommendations to made re to made relevant ministers and health departments of the devolved administrations. It may assist our consideration of the petition if we can get some confirmation of that. Each of the submissions also expressed support for the suggestion of a move to an individual risk-based system, considering that it could eliminate discrimination and improve confidence in the system. SNBTS supports the concept in principle, but suggests that a lack of evidence, interpretation of individual risk assessment and time and resource constraints have an impact on the feasibility of such a move. It adds an online confidential donor selection portal, as suggested by the petitioners during evidence to the committee, would be possible to implement, but would have to be scoped, designed and constructed. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions on what action we might take. Um, I had a members debate on this, um, this subject. Um, I think we're at a stage now where we need to seek an update basically on, on, on what's you know what's been going on uh, an update from the government and from sabto on this the status of the review uh, being undertaken by the donor selection working group and i, I think there's a, a cross-party um group in westminster meeting next month as well so you know i think okay. it i think it's time just to regroup okay. and have an update given the constraints of time can i assume that the Yep. The committee agrees with that. So yes, we'll seek an update yeah. and, and we can um, pursue the issues from there. Can I just, in conclusion, um, thank all the members of the committee and the clerks to the committee and the official report and everyone who supports the committee for all, everything, all their help and support over the last year. I think we can be proud of the work that we've done, um, the number of petitions we've dealt with and the opportunity we've afforded petitioners to raise a whole range of issues with us. So I just thank everyone, and I should also thank Spice, because I think they have a particular role um, in this committee that they maybe are more burdened than by others. And finally, can I just thank Maurice Corey. I'm very sorry to hear that he is leaving the committee, but we've, it's been a pleasure working with you, Maurice, and we wish you well in your new committee, and we can always invite you back when you're coming to support individual um, petitions and we look forward to working with your colleague um, when she becomes a member of the committee. So with that, can I... I've also been appointed there as a into the committee, so, so with I, that, may be, can I may be I, back. Uh, <laughs> wish everybody all the best for the summer and look forward to seeing you um, in September. Thank you very much. That closing meeting. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.